Hi, welcome to Malloy. My name is Susie Bloom. I'm an associate librarian and I'm a head of instructional services. I am the liaison for criminal justice, fine arts, history and political science, paralegal studies, and physical education. I'm also an alumni. I got my second master's at Malloy in criminal justice in 2014. So let's start by talking about the basics of scholarly searching, specifically how it's different from using Google. Now, if you're like me, you use Google every day. And it's great if you're looking to find movie tickets or you want to buy shoes. But it's not the best if you're doing scholarly research, mostly because that's not what it was designed to do. When you're using Google, you could just ask it a question. You could just say, what medicine do you use for skin cancer? And you'll get results. Now, you might have to wade through hundreds of results to find what you're looking for, but eventually you'll hit it. Now, with library resources, you don't want to ask it a question. You want to think about the words that are most likely to come up in your dream article. What words are unique and specific that will come up in that article that aren't going to come up in other articles that aren't what you're looking for? So a word like what is going, isn't specific enough. It's going to come up in all kinds of articles that are irrelevant to your use. So the most important words here are something like skin cancer, except professionals in the field aren't going to use a layman's term like skin cancer. They're going to use a more specific term that's more relevant to the field. So they might say something like melanoma and treatment. I also see students often doing this. Professor says, oh, I want scholarly articles discussing themes in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and that's exactly what they put into the search box. Except when you're writing a paper, you don't actually say, I am now writing a paper. The word paper probably doesn't actually appear in your paper. Same thing here. Professionals aren't going to say scholarly article in their scholarly article, so we don't want those words. We want the most important words here. Well, what are they? Well, Pride and Prejudice is definitely an important one. And I also decided to pick a specific theme rather than just searching for themes in general. If I choose a particular theme, it's going to make my research a lot more focused and I'll avoid articles that I can't use in my particular paper. You'll also notice that I put some words in quotes. For example, pride and prejudice. If I didn't put them in quotes, I might have the word pride in the first paragraph and prejudice in the last paragraph. By putting it in quotes, I'm saying that I specifically want these words in that specific order. Most of the time when you're doing research in college, your professors are going to expect you to be using peer-reviewed articles, which are normally found in scholarly journals. Scholarly journals provide timely information to scholars or professionals in a variety of fields. They're written for scholars by scholars. They're going to use the language that is common to that field and they're going to be done at a very high level. They're usually printed by academic institutions or professional organizations and they're mostly peer reviewed. This is very important for ensuring quality. It's not a guarantee, but it is a step in finding something that is vastly more trustworthy than a blog post, for example. If I wanted to get an article printed in Rolling Stone, I would send it to my editor, he'd tell me I'm brilliant, and he'd print it. If I want to get an article published in a peer-reviewed scholarly journal, I send it to my editor and he takes all my identifying features, my name and um, where I'm working off. He sends it off to experts in the field, not just experts in a general sense, but experts in the very specific area that I am looking at. They're going to look at my methods and my writing and frankly, tear it apart. They're going to send all of their suggestions back and I'm going to keep perfecting it until it's finally ready based on my immediate peers signing off on it. Then it can finally be published in a journal. So it's usually a very trustworthy source. While Google is showing you quote unquote answers, academic discovery tools are reflecting the scholarly conversation around a subject. So a wide range of opinions are to be expected. Remember that these are not necessarily right or wrong. Scholars have a conversation where they're trying to get at truth and sometimes they'll argue with each other quite vigorously. Part of your job as a student is to find all of the different aspects of that conversation so that you see the whole picture of a particular topic. 
So some examples, the Berkeley Journal of Criminal Law, Oxford University's Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Science, Journal of Literacy Research. Just a warning, I'm going to show you where you can click off on a box that says that you only want peer reviewed only. However, what that is saying is that you only want articles if they are printed in journals that contain peer reviewed articles. You may also find um, letters to the editor, conference proceedings, calendar of events, um, book reviews, those sorts of things. So how do you know that the article you're looking at is scholarly? Well, first off, it's going to be written by an expert in the field, often a professor who tells you where they're affiliated up front. It has an abstract, a summary of the article. The journal is peer reviewed. It will often, though not always, report on original research and often, but not always, provide charts and graphs. It contains jargon that's relevant to the field. I just scrolled further down in the same article, and now you can see that they have very extensive footnotes or citations. This actually has several pages of citations. And it's long. Frankly, if you're looking at an article and it's only two or three pages, it's probably not a scholarly article. Now, a couple of quick tips. You want to start out broad and add terms or limiters one at a time. Don't throw everything in at the same time because if you get no results, you're not sure why you got no results. So add a, a term, take away a term, add a limiter, take away a limiter. You, there's not a perfect formula. You need to be flexible when you're doing your research. Also, make sure everything is spelled correctly. If it wasn't for spell check, I'd probably be still in English 1100. Um, I'm not the greatest speller. Library resources are going to assume however you spelled something, that's what you're looking for. So if you spell it incorrectly, you just get no results. So Google is great for this, right? They'll say, oh, did you mean such and such? And then they'll do the search for you. So oftentimes if I'm not sure how to spell a word correctly, I'll just throw it into Google and make sure that it's spelled right before I go into the library databases. Don't use punctuation because they mean different things to the computer. Remember that you're talking to a computer. You're not talking to a person. When you put a question mark at the end of a question, a human says, oh, you're asking a question but a library database is going to think that you're giving it a command. Also, don't use abbreviations because they can mean different things in different fields and you might get something that's completely um, irrelevant to your particular topic.